Many okay. thanks for being with us. And uh, we head straight to checking out the front pages of our national dailies this morning on The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. And we will have a Kola Wale, Tunde Kola Wale, who is a legal practitioner. He's on standby. Good morning, Kola Wale. Good morning, my sister. How was your weekend? Very well, thank you for asking. All right, so um, we just head straight to the papers and then, of course, you join us in a bit. I start off with the Daily Trust newspaper this morning. Let's find out uh, what big stories are on the Daily Trust newspaper. Now, the banner caption reads, Federal Government Punctures Lagos NSAS Panel Report Identifies 10 Loopholes. That's a bold caption. Underneath, you have, says, it's triumph of fake news. No massacre at Lekki Toll Gate. That's the first rider. Underneath, you still have, we're awaiting committee's report. That's what the Lagos state government is quoted to say. Federal government not legally bound by panel report. A senior advocate of Nigeria quoted on that. So it feels like there's a back and forth. World Bank to Nigeria and fuel subsidy in six months. So you have the IMF speaking. And now, you know, the uh, World Bank is also speaking. And the question will be, can, can't we, you know, uh, administer? Can we go ahead with our, our business and, you know, do what we want to do with our country without having all of this advice? Mm -hmm. uh, well, these are some of the questions we hope to answer. Nigerians can survive four more years under APC. Uh, the PDP governors are quoted on that. You also find um, EFCC grills Fanny Kaya Day for forgery. It's also a big one on the Daily Trust newspaper this morning. And Boko Haram forcing parents to withdraw children from schools. Niger government is quoted. That's a big one. Says 151,000. 380 villages displaced in 30 communities. We can't control cooking gas pricing. That's what the federal government is quoted to say. And reps pass bill to end H&D degree dichotomy. And that's the much on the Daily Trust newspaper this morning. On the Daily Trust, uh, our next uh, port of call is the Daily Independent. With the major headline this morning, Petrol may rise to 340 naira per litre in 2022. That's according to the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation, the NNPC. Uh, we derided it there. Federal government to pay 40 million Nigerians 5,000 naira transport grant to replace fuel subsidy. All right. Uh, below that pictorial, there's uh, another story. World Bank lists measures to put Nigeria on the growth Pass. All right, federal government rejects Lagos and SARS panel report, wants more investigations. Another story, 2023, we've learned our lessons. We're ready for Asa Rock. That's according to the PDP governors. Igbo Ho drags AGF, BSS, CBN to court over 20.5 billion judgment cost. Well, the rider court grants. Uh, Garnishy order against uh, the federal government. Soldier IPOB member killed as troops tackle arsonists. All right, avoid corruption or regret being a judge. CJN wants judicial officers that's on the red strip below. Above the masthead on the Daily Independent this morning, hiking price of cooking gas not under our control. Uh, FG, Buhari sends delegation to Nimbe over Roy spillage. MPC blames food inflation on worsening security situation. Whether well, the rider retains MPR or the parameters to sustain economic recovery. Those are the stories you can find on the Daily Independent this Wednesday morning. All right, let's move away from the Daily Independent newspaper and check out the leadership on the front page of the leadership newspaper. Lagos hashtag NSAS panel. Civil society, uh, civil society divided over federal government's dismissal of report as fake news. It's boldly uh, written on the leadership this morning. Information minister says report full of errors and calls panel disgrace. It's a shoddy job, waste of resources. This, uh, you know, some of the words uh, the panel 
uh, that report has been described as. Fuel subsidy removal, federal government to spend 200 billion naira on palliatives monthly. And it's also another one you find there away from that. Niger raises the alarm over ESWAP Boko Haram camps near Kenji. Vice President tax directors on grooming youths for leadership. EFCC invites Fanny Kayode over forgery. And COVID-19, CBN intervention hit 2.6 trillion naira. You also find federal government launches enhanced passport in the United Kingdom. And I said on the leadership newspaper this morning. And finally, we also have uh, the Punch, a newspaper making banner headlines and SARS is actually spread across several dailies this morning. Amnesty, or this knock federal government, is lie, rubbish, lucky massacre report. The two writers there, panel wasted taxpayers' money. It was a nonsensical report, says Lai Mohammed. There is general conclusion in Nigeria that uh, minister is an unrepentant liar. That's according to an activist. All other stories on the Punch newspaper this morning. EFCC depends on the least 100 billionaires camp probe. NIS holds on to passport. We've moved through Ondo Ekiti Kogi Kwara during two weeks in kidnappers. Uh, then. That's according to one of the victims. My father never recovered from the NDLEA ordeal, Babasuwe's son. Judge obtains plea bargain, Jill's copper or co member for the frauding American in a romance or romance scam. We are probing those behind release of Adedoi's audio defense uh, command. DSS contests. A uh, 20 billion naira fine on Igboho says the Taini undergoing extradition. More stories on the punch just beside the masthead. Dollar shortage, subsidy, deficit, financing threatening Nigeria's growth, according to the World Bank. Seized vessels, Navy advocates maritime offenders court, lament maintenance costs. All right, above the masthead, uh, panel faced to quiz Bala Usman six months after suspension as NPA bus. All right, just beside that one, EFCC picks up Fanny Kayade for alleged forgery, document manipulation. Governor says subsidy will hamper salaries in 2022, back 5,000 Naira grant. Nigerians in diaspora spent $2.94 billion to remit. 34.8 billion naira dollars. That's according to reports you can find on page 28 of the Punch newspaper for this morning. All right, uh, we just uh, were being joined by Tunde Kolawole this morning, a legal practitioner. Tunde Kolawole, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Right. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay, so let's head straight to it this morning. I mean, uh, dominating the papers is the fact that the federal government has faulted the report of uh, the uh, panel, the leaked report of the panel, as well with the white paper. What are your thoughts? And according to the Minister of Information and Info uh, Communication, Lai Mohamed, oh, honestly, he describes it as fake news. Let's share your thoughts on that. Honestly speaking, the statement by the federal government and especially the one that has been made by the information minister is very, very shameful. It is incorrigible. It is very insensitive to the memories of um, the young people who lost names, who shed their blood, who are killed, including the security people who also lost their lives in the end of the uprising which most of you prefer to call a protest. I call it an uprising. Why do I say the statement of the minister is incorrigible and irresponsible? I'm saying it because you and I will remember that the complaint against the security agencies, especially against the police, the, the special anti this war, it didn't start in the year 2020. It started in the year 2017. And if the federal government had lied to its responsibility, they would have looked at the complaint of Nigerians, addressed those complaints, 
And we will not have had the uprising that we had in the year 2020. So for you not to be complaining that all the reports that are, the panel report that has been submitted is fake news, it doesn't mean. Furthermore, you will recollect that the National Human Rights Commission, which is an agency of the federal government, had also written a detailed report chronicling all the horrendous activities of not just the SARS, but also the police and the army, and made recommendations for certain police officers to be arrested and tried, and for some people who have lost their lives, who have been injured in the hands of the police to be compensated. And this report was sent to the Attorney General of the Federation. And what did the Attorney General of the Federation do? He merely wrote on that report that there are not enough evidence to prosecute the police officers that were indicted and also not enough evidence to compensate those that the National Human Rights Commission had recommended recommendation should be a paid to. Now, the German case, a very particular case, somebody was arrested, he just go to, went to court for the enforcement of fundamental human rights. And the court was in Bailey or thereabouts. He insisted that the police, especially Pakistan, who was later indicted by the FBI for having, for, for, for nothing, with the hush puppy, that they should bring the body of uh, the man arrested by the South, dead or alive. See, today, the Nigerian police have never been guilty. Obey that court order. Obey that court order. And let's leave that aside. When you look at the panel that was set up by the state government, most of the people on that panel are representatives of the government, of the legal state government. The only odd person now is probably Oduala. The lady was said to be representing the youth. And the lady later on uh, withdrew from the panel. When her uh, account was, um, was uh, I think, a uh, uh, pegged or shipped or whatever, uh, by the government, and then she wasn't feeling comfortable again uh, with the panel. So if your own panel, if I'm not going to use a panel that you set up, populated by 99.9% of the all representatives, is coming up with this kind of very indicting report. What is now the basis for you to start jumping to the conclusion? You merely dwell on, on fake news. That doesn't make sense of that looks like just a mere, a uh, mere calling a dog a bad name in order to hang it. Father Molai Mohammed also said that uh, the panel did uh, address the issue of the security men that were killed. That is not true. There is a section of the report that deals with the policemen and soldiers that were killed. Even though the terms of reference, the panel was not for that police. Because the police have a way of dealing with their own issues, of addressing their own problems. But still, the panel bent backwards to address the issue of the policemen and the soldiers who were killed during the end panel. Furthermore, let me enlighten you further. In law, especially in our court, there are certain things that we call clerical errors. Because when the court is sitting or when the panel is sitting, they are provided with recorders, they are provided with clerical staff, they are provided with proof readers, and all manners of secretariat that would, at the end of the day, help them tidy up the report, help them clean up the report before they have sent their signatures and what have you. So if there are clerical errors in this report, which is terrible in my own opinion, do you now start blaming the honorable members of the panel or whatever flimsy error that you might see in there, look at what happened not recently in long ago. The Supreme Court was compiling lists of senior voters of Nigeria. Inadvertently, put the name of somebody who was not supposed to be there, which they later apologized for. That was a clerical. Does that detail, does that, uh, does that invalidate, does it detail 
So if you end up no get you, the list of a uh, senior advocate that was eventually uh, compounded, the list of people that are eventually given the senior advocate of Nigerian uh, 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 not in my opinion. So this to me is a very, very strange. It's a uh, very uh, peculiar. It's a part of the antecedent of Mr. Lai Muhammad to start um, condemning and controlling and uh, making all sorts of information in order to rubbish whatever report doesn't fit or doesn't uh, meet the case or does not applaud the federal government for doing the wrong thing. They also talked about ballistic missiles. And very fundamentally, all the people who have given information as evidence to that panel are all us, or they are all civil servants. The pathologist is a civil servant, the soldiers are civil servants, the police are civil servants, the nurses are civil servants, those who work, who work in the military are civil servants. Those who are the ambulances that carry most of the shot and wounded people to the hospital full time. These are people who, because of the fear for the loss of their job, or the demand by the government, were not too enthusiastic in going to that panel to reveal what actually happened. Look at the way the pathologist was speaking at the panel. He was speaking from both sides of his mouth. He was asked questions. How many people did you receive in your hospital? How many pathological examinations did you carry out? He said, look, I don't go to the street to start picking up dead bodies. It is only the bodies that are given to me to conduct a post that I work on. That shows you that these people are handicapped. That shows you that the panel from the beginning is working from a very, from high hand, from a very difficult position. That all manners of obstacles have been put on the head of this panel, so as not to be able to get hardcore evidence with which to work. That the panel has the quality to come out in spite of all the difficult place before it, with, to come out with the kind of report that we are seeing, I think is common too. And I look all at right, the people on that panel Kalele. as men of integrity, all right, boys, as the interest of the Nigerian youth at heart. All right, Vice Kalali, uh, let's, uh, let's uh, look at other issues because there are so many issues we need to discuss in as much as... Hello? That, yeah, let's uh, look at other issues in as much as the NSAS, uh, Lagos NSAS report is very, very important, topical. But there are other issues that Nigerians are actually, you know, talking right. about let's this morning. Okay, let's talk about uh, the removal of fuel subsidy and the federal government are planning to spend uh, 200 billion there on palliatives. Specifically, they want to give them... Um, uh, 5,000 Naira grants to about 40 million Nigerians. And the governors say the subsidy will hamper salaries and they are backing the federal government in that light. What is your reaction to all of this? Uh, the question I would ask you, a very rhetorical question. Since they have printed that money, giving all manners of money to different people and all that, which is more than two, three years ago now, have you seen any difference it has made in the life of our people? The answer is no. Because such money we give to them is not enough to solve the problem that these, all these traders, all these poor people already have on ground. They just use them to eat. It is not enough to empower them. What the Bible says is that we should teach a man how to and not continue to increase so that the dependency syndrome no more be there. So you take a token 5,000 naira and give it to a man or a woman who has a house rent of about 10,000 naira to pay in a month, school fees to pay, THCM bill of 15,000 naira to pay, transportation to go to work and come back. What difference would that make? It doesn't make any money. Any difference. As regards to the subsidy, is it not only that a government that when it was coming to power in 2015 said there was no subsidy on petroleum or on fuel products in Nigeria? So now be paying subsidies. So be paying the kind of mongrel subsidies that we are seeing them pay since they came into power. Even that ironica, even that for using that state, but I have said it, and this is my personal opinion. 
I don't mind that they should remove the subsidy. And why do I say I don't mind? This is a lie that the Nigerian Women and Life has been telling for decades for their inefficiency, for their incompetence, for their irresponsible way of governance. So after they have removed this subsidy, let us also know or let us see what for they are telling Nigeria for their incompetence, for their inability to grow the Nigerian economy. Yes, it will be painful. If they dare to remove the subsidy, that will be the end of the second crop of ruling class that we have here. I foresee a massive uprising that will be a kind of size play from what we to suddenly the end of the uh, process. You say you are subsidized, and that is what is weighing you down while you are unable to deliver the dividend of democracy. And let you still open the newspaper. You see a mongrel amount of money that has been stolen in the different places and parasites. How do you reconcile that? Okay. Um, Today, um, 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 cost of uh, project. Mr. Tunde Kolawale, let's also, um, in the same light of subsidy, my question now is if you look at the Daily Trust, uh, you find out that the World Bank is asking Nigeria to end fuel subsidy in six months. And we also had the fact that, um, you know, the uh, IMF, that's the International Monetary Fund, has also spoken and say, hey, end subsidy. My, so w why is it that the, this financial institution are really interested in what happens in the Nigerian economy? In the third world, where IMF and World Bank prescription has ever worked. IMF prescription and the World Bank prescription work in an economy where there's a productive base, where there are industries, where are agriculture is there, is there. Is a, is a working. This is a dependency economy. It is an economy that is a rentier economy. An economy that depends solely on selling a, a crude petroleum products and then using the money to import goods and services. Is that a, an economy that goes to the amenable? So I am a World Bank prescription. All this getting wood program does not apply to the court. The basis of a wheat process can work. There has no existence in our, in our society. They are not existent in Nigeria. They are suddenly been massive for fighting in all cases. They are in their position as everything applies. Go and check, go and check your report. Okay, because so, so as much as you're saying that the um, their position has never been. Tunde Kolawale, the, the question be, is. They might be headed to. Tunde Kolawale, my question is why are they really interested in what happens in the Nigerian economy? Could it be that, you know, because we constantly go to them for uh, funds to borrow resources. Could it be the reason? Just. We are owing the Paris Club. We are owing the Sudan Club. We are owing the World Bank. We are owing the Chinese. We are owing the Arab. We are owing so many countries, so many organizations around the world that our grants might not even be able to repay. So it is in order for us to be able to repay our debt. That is why they are making all these restrictions. And it is not strange. When you are owing money, the creditor has the risk and may have a justification. So impose some uh, sanctions or impose some decisions on you or impose some guidelines. So it is that you cut your clothes according to the size of your clothes so that you don't repay him. They are not giving out those decisions because they love us, because they want us to do the Nigerian economy. They are thinking of how we are going to be able to repay back. The mongrels are most of low that the present government in particular has been piling us in 2015. All right, uh, Barista Kolawale, another story that uh, made headlines on the Punch uh, newspaper. This morning is uh, the MPA probe, and uh, Punch actually captions it this way. Panel faced to quiz Bala Osman six months after suspension as NPA boss. How does that hit you? Well, uh, uh, that young lady's uh, story is a very interesting one. I suspect that uh, our case is that of a high wired politics that is being played by the Minister of Transport and the Governor of uh, Cardinal State, Malam Elufai. You have to remember that uh, the Banat lady used to be the chief of uh, and personal assistant of Madame Rufai at a particular time, and also work with Rufai when Rufai was at the Federal Capital Territory as Minister. It was also that he recommended her 
for the present job. And uh, it would appear to me that uh, governor, former Governor Yoshi Miyamichi is not too sure of her loyalty, is not getting whatever she expects from her in terms of uh, the kind of loyalty that should be expected from somebody heading the Panasata under our ministry. That might be one of the reasons, or that is my suspicion, why the lady has a, a present problem. But besides that, when you look at the way and manner, the lady has also been managing the Nigerian Port Authority. You would have seen that she has been doing it in a very pretender and tribal manner. I give you an example. There was a suggestion that because of the congestion in the ports in Lagos, that another port should be built in Batagri, and another one that the lady. The woman opposed it very softly. She never looked at the merit of two sports. She's only interested in not seeing another post being built in Lagos and not in the southwest and not in Portacos and not in River State. It's like a she's there to protect the interests of certain sections of the country. It is not impossible. I wrote to me I also have seen through that and because of that he has found a way to get uh, rid of her. Her case is political. And I don't see her returning uh, to that post so long as she remains Minister of uh, 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 Transport. Nobody is interested in uh, interviewing or looking at the merit or the demerit of her case. Okay. Her case is uh, simply and uh, straightforwardly, if you permit me to use the word, political. Okay, um, uh, let's move away from that now and look at an issue of uh, security in Niger State. Boko Haram forcing parents to withdraw children from school. Uh, this is according to the Niger State government, and that's on the Daily Trust newspaper. Now, you also have reports saying that 151,380 villagers have been displaced in 30 communities. Uh, what do you make of this? When I am not surprised, I recollect that when the Boko Haram insurgency first started, I got in an interview to a newspaper house, and I raised an alarm and said, look, if you are unable to defeat or cause the Boko Haram insurgency within two, three years, and you allow them to be there for about 10 years, the possibility that you never be able to defeat them uh, will never be there again. Because within the period, they would have mastered the terrain, they would have so, so perfected their supply routes, they would have seen the weaknesses of the Nigerian security, especially the army, and then they would have become very part to agents. And then too, the Nigerian army would have become weary, tired, of uh, fighting the war, for over 10 years without uh, any sign that the war is going to be won. Furthermore, the Boko Haram people too would have become emboldened that uh, the journey they have embarked upon is uh, doable. That is what we are seeing today. The Boko Haram is becoming more audacious. The citizens who are becoming weary and they are becoming tired and now beginning to cooperate with the Boko Haram. Because they have seen that the federal government or the Nigerian military that should come to their rescue has failed them. So, if the Book Quran is going to guarantee peace, security for them, enough space to be able to live in their community without uh, fear of losing their lives and limbs and all that, why not cooperate with the Book Quran? So, what happens so to being the chief security all over the, the state? All over the world. That is guerrilla warfare. It is a fleeting war. It is always moving from one theater to the other. It is not a sedentary war. We don't stay put. Any gorilla army that stays put in one particular place is not constantly moving. It is quickly wiped out. So that is why you find now the Boko Haram will be in Boronu today. Tomorrow it is in Niger State. Tomorrow it is in Koto State. That is the classical strategy of fighting an effective gorilla. Okay. I should think 
that is the strategy and tactics that the program has also uh, uh, mastered. More importantly, you will recollect that uh, the Cameroonian uh, army were also uh, ambassador and uh, freedom fighters were killed recently of making an incursion. I think was it to Gongola State or one of the states in there. The governor of the state raised uh, uh, his voice, cried out that uh, the governor doesn't have the wherewithal, that they are not empowered by law to really deal with security. And that when those people came in, he was helpless. The same thing is happening in Niger State today. Even if the Niger State governor sees this um, Boko Haram coming in there, uh, building tents, taking over community, collecting taxes and not, what power does he have? What soldier does he have? What equipment does he have? But logically, to contend that before but, but, the federal government arrives at the scene, uh, every power. Every quasi power is concentrated Mr. in the hands Tunde of the Kola Wale. commander in chief Tunde Kola in the Wale. federal government. Mr. Tunde Kola Wale, please allow me to yes, you know, come in there uh, with this because I totally understand that you know powers are not with the state government, but in its sense, I mean, however it's been put, they are chief security officers of their state, and we cannot forget the security votes that's been released you know, every other time and what we don't know what's going on. So I, I feel like we can't just wake up and throw our hands and say, oh, because we have not been empowered by the law. And you were elected because it is government responsibility at every level to protect lives and properties. So I, I really do not understand. And the question is, so what happens to you being the chief security officer of your state? Well, uh, honestly speaking, on paper, the governors are the chief security officer of their respective state. But does the commissioner of police in their state, do they report to them? Does the director of state security service report to the governor? Does the DOC of the army barracks in the respective state report to the governor? If the governor wants to use any of those security forces, he will talk to them, and those people will talk to their superior in Abuja, and then the superior in Abuja, either the IG, or the chief of army staff, or the director general of the would have to get approval from uh, the commander in chief, which is Mr. President, before the soldier, before the police, before the DSS can be deployed in the recessive state. In between the time all this approval will be given, whoever wants to commit mayhem, the Boko Haram that wants to take over territory, would have established themselves on the ground. But more importantly, too, you and I do know that the governors themselves also have their blame. They take a mongrel amount of money in billions on a monthly basis as security vote. But do they, do they spend the money on security? No! They divert the money, they embezzle the money, they use the money to pay uh, offers or be social assistance and all that, to buy loyalty, to buy votes, and they do all manner of things that are not related to security. Because just like you said, there are certain little, little things that the governors could do that would have enhanced the security architecture of their state. Let's take the example of Lagos State, which for me is a noble example. They have set up a kind of security trust fund in which all the businesses, all the um, rich people in the community put in some funds. And they buy vehicles, they buy uh, helicopters, they buy uh, boats to patrol the waters and all that. And they also put CCTV camera in certain places such that all those things hamper and a kind of disincentive to whoever may want to come to Lagos and then um, engage the community. But that is not the situation we are finding ourselves in the northern part of the country, oh, especially okay. Kaduna and the Niger State that is boiling now. Oh, Rather, they want the federal government to show that the responsibility all right, but of providing Kola, the money and the We have, in fact, understood all the all position on all of that. It shouldn't be that. As we conclude, but, now, more importantly, all right, as we conclude Barrister Kola, Ole, if I can just get a word in edgewise, uh, on the final note, I just want you to comment very quickly in 30 seconds. Uh, the final story we will analyze this morning, EFCC peak subs are Fani Kayode for alleged forgery and document manipulation. Very quickly, I want you to comment on that. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that uh, the EFCC 
as we gain going to find a coyote. You know, I think he has about one or two cases in court, presently. And the smart man uh, will probably think that if he cross over to the APC, all the sessions uh, will be forgiven. Because that has been the precedent, that has been the antecedent of politicians who have soiled their hands in their political parties. Immediately the ESCC or the ICPC or the police have to move after them. They go to the APC, the ruling party, and then like my chairman of APC will say, that I'm sure I'm all their previous things will be erased and then they'll be forgiven. And then they can go home and see no more and spend the whatever money they have um, uh, stolen without harassment, intimidation from any quarter. So if the ESCC is going after uh, Fanny Kaya at this point in time, it's not impossible that they don't want to extend that gesture to Mr. Fanny Kaya, probably because of his antecedent, probably because of the way and manner he has uh, insulted, he has uh, lampooned, he has castigated, and tried to disrupt the reputation of so many people in the ruling party. And he has rubbish the ruling party in newspapers, in uh, social media, and then on radio and television programs in the past. They may want to teach him some lessons. I said before that with what he has done in the past of these people, I have a fear that they might not be extended out like this. They might not be extended out of, of uh, uh, forgiving this uh, uh, corruption and uh, uh, case because uh, the man, uh, in a way, nearly torpedoed uh, in the present economic uh, power to incendiary commentaries that he's been making all over the place. But nobody is above the law. If a family guy or they is suspected to have committed a law, I don't see anything wrong in the EFCC Picking or the up. ICPC or the SAD or the all police. Right. Uh, Colin, to come and uh, answer to those uh, All right, thank you so much, Barrister Tunde Kolaoli. That's indeed as much as we can take on off the press and this morning. We appreciate your time. We will be discussing more in just a moment and then uh, we analyze what happened in history uh, today.